Welcome to our third webinar in this week of webinars this week. My name is Tom Carpenter. I'm the CTO here at CWNP, and we have Kimberly Graves, the Curriculum and Certification Manager from Aruba Networks with us today as well. Hi, Kimberly. Hi, Tom. We are uh, excited to have her with us. She's going to be giving us some insight into things that sometimes you can't always get from a vendor neutral organization like us because we don't have all of the insight into everything that's going on in the various vendors. So it's exciting for us as well as for you to get to learn about uh, some of the new features and capabilities and different innovations going on with the Aruba Networks technology. So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Before we get into that, just a quick reminder, the Wi-Fi Trek Conference is now under 30 days away. So it's coming up very quickly. We're gonna be in Fun San Diego uh, in mid to late October. And if you haven't registered, wanna get more information, make sure you go to conferences.cwnp.com. That's conferences cwnp.com to get more information and to register today. Also, it's important to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our YouTube channel at CWNP TV. So you can always go back and review this information again because I know there are always good insights in these guest webinars that we have with the various vendors and the friends of CWNP. So with that said, without any further ado, I'm going to turn Kimberly loose and let her tell us what's been going on at Aruba and give us some good insights there. So Kimberly, take it away. Thanks, Tom. Um, so yeah, as Tom mentioned, my name is Kimberly Graves. I am the um, course curriculum and certification manager for Aruba Networks. And what that essentially means is that I'm responsible for all of the training courses and all the certification exams um, that are created by Aruba. We've got a, a pretty good team of um, developers who create that course content for us and create our certification exams. So um, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing at Wi-Fi Trek. Um, so I will be there doing um, some deep dive sessions. So a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in here today, you'll actually be seeing live demos of that um, during the deep dives at Wi-Fi Trek. So I want to encourage you know everyone who's attending to, um, to the, attending the conference, to obviously come to the Aruba uh, deep dive session. So you can kind of see a little bit more hands-on um, and see actual demos of some of these new products and new solutions that we have um, coming out from Aruba. And then if you're not registered for the conference, obviously, as, as Tom has already mentioned, um, you know, we, I've been a longtime supporter of um, CWNP and Wi-Fi Trek. So I, I highly encourage everybody um, to, you know, go ahead and register and, and come to that conference. It's um, amazing the, um, the knowledge that you'll gain from some of the experts that will be there. So I, I highly encourage everybody to attend the conference. Um, as far as how to reach me, um, my email address is there. It's Kimberly.Graves at HPE.com. I'm also on Twitter at Kimberly A. Graves. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, as I said, basically what I want to do is go through some of the new Aruba innovations. Um, you know, a lot of these things have, have been talked about even in other webinars. Um, I know Dave Coleman just did a big presentation on um, 11AX. Um, there's been a lot of talk about 11AD. So I want to kind of show you what Aruba has in those, um, in those spaces and some of the new things that we're doing in terms of how we're unifying our wireless and our wired, um, wired access policies. So most of these features are built on our new AOS 8 platform. Uh, we are currently in uh, release uh, 8.4 of AOS. So what we'll be looking at today is some of the ways we do um, dynamic micro policies. Um, dynamic segmentation, some network automation, um, some of the redundancy and load balancing features that we get out of AOS 8 with the clustering technology. And then, as I said, we'll be looking at some of those new products that Aruba has coming out, um, the 11AD um, AP and some of the 11AX APs that are, that are on the horizon for us. So um, I'm sure most people are familiar with Aruba Networks. Um, as a company, uh, we were founded in 2002 um, and you know, has, have since been kind of a leader in the wireless LAN market space. Um, in um, 2015, um, Aruba uh, was acquired by HPE and um, continues to operate under the HPE umbrella. What that did for us as a company is it provided us um, the ability to do both wired and wireless um, unified access. So we've taken a lot of the same features that we've already had in our NAC technology, in our access control policies, and we've now been able to implement that into the wired side of the network as well. So that's 
a lot of what you're going to be seeing in this presentation here is kind of how we've put those two things together with with wired and uh, and wireless. So we term this new um, kind of technology dynamic micro policy. Um, we'll talk we'll talk a little more about roles and and security policies in the network, but essentially micro policy is a way that we can implement very small, very granular um, security policies and access policies and do it in a very dynamic uh, mechanism. Um, Aruba has also in the past acquired a couple other organizations. Uh, one is Avenda, um, and also we have Airwave in there. Um, and these things have all turned into um, a new uh, kind of a, a new server product for us, and that is the ClearPass um, authentication server. So a lot of what we're going to be seeing in here in terms of applying a, a dynamic policy is going to be done with the use of ClearPass. Um, we also, as I mentioned, have now been able to extend this micro policy concept to our both our wired and our wireless infrastructure. So the idea here is to get visibility, um, unified deployment, and, and basically bring all of these wireless capabilities that we've had now into our wired network. Um, we also are focusing um, more on management capabilities. So being able to, in one dashboard or one interface, manage both our wired and wireless network. And we do that right now with, um, with the Aruba Airwave product. So what does this micro policy mean? Um, so essentially the idea of micro policy is, is it's very granular, it's very specific. Um, and of course we wanna provide some sort of enforcement. So that enforcement might be um, VLANs. Um, it might be um, firewall policies. It might be traffic prioritization that we do through our, um, our roles, user roles. So the idea of the dynamic part of it is that we don't have to have um, you know, IT administrator intervention it will just happen automatically. So when everything is deployed and configured, we will get um, a dynamic micro policy applied to our different users as they connect to the network, whether that be on the wired or on the wireless side. The other you know, concept that Aruba has always been strong in is obviously mobility. So the idea is that this, this policy is enforced across the entire network environment. So whether that user is connecting on the wireless or the wired side, it's gonna follow these users um, you know, wherever they, wherever they may roam um, throughout the network. So some of the ways that we um, deliver this network automation, and we'll be talking about some of these things in here. Obviously, there's um, a lot more to it in terms of configuration and deployment and making all these pieces and parts fit together um, to get the unified policies. So some of the, the mechanisms that allow us to do this network automation would be our RF optimization features. So we've got two features within that, one's client match and the other one is air match. Um, and what this allows us to do is really optimize our access points, the channel, the power, um, after the network has basically learned about what the RF environment looks like. So we take into account all of the other um, outside RF interference, the other access points that are that are in the air, kind of taking a, a big picture holistic view of what the RF environment looks like. And then we're able to apply policies to the access points to set certain channels and power. And of course, this is all dynamic. Um, we recognize we don't want to make too many rapid changes. So there's um, certainly an algorithm in there um, that kind of um, dampens the, the changing of the RF environment, but at the same time, presenting the best um, user experience. So the best load balancing to different access points um, and the best um, channel optimization. We'll also be talking about segmentation in here. So it's kind of a new concept called dynamic segmentation. And the idea is that um, as users connect across the wired and wireless network, their access policies will be applied um, automatically. And we do that through, um, through the use of ClearPass and, and obviously our controller um, infrastructure. Some of the other features that we see in AOS 8 are seamless failover and live upgrade. So we'll talk about that a little bit. The idea is all to keep our network up and running um, and maintain connectivity for users as they roam across the network. So let me kind of jump in a little more of the meat of, of how we do some of these things, because I know probably most of you are wanting to know more about the actual technology and, and how all this happens. Um, we obviously have a limited amount of time here, so I'm gonna just give you some quick snapshots of our capabilities and what we're able to do. And as I've said before, if you're interested in more, you wanna see it all in action, 
that's what those deep dive sessions are at the Wi-Fi track. And then also um, Aruba has um, training courses on all of these um, you know, configurations as well. So the first big um, AOS 8 feature is the clustering. So the concept of clustering has, um, has really rolled into all of the load balancing and the redundancy features and the ability for us to have seamless roaming um, across our entire wireless infrastructure. So we'll be getting to some of the, the actual details of how clustering is implemented um, in terms of how it's done with anchor controllers. And um, I'll show you some few slides on that. Uh, we'll talk more about the, the roles, um, the cluster roles, how the stateful failover occurs. So when a client roams from one AP to another, and even across controllers, we can maintain the client state, meaning we know um, all the information, uh, the fingerprinting of the client, we know the OS of it, um, you know, we know uh, what current um, uh, firewall sessions that that user has um, on that device. So we're able to maintain that state uh, across the network. We'll talk again also about the, the live upgrade and how we can load modules um, while the network is running. So, you know, the whole idea is to try to reduce the amount of network downtime and maintenance windows that we have and, and um, maintain the network while it's in while it's in service. So just a quick snapshot of what is clustering. So um, I'm going to throw some kind of new terms that are probably some of the people are, if you're not real familiar with the uh, with the Aruba terminology. But we have this concept of a mobility master. So the mobility master maintains all of the configuration for all of our um, SSID wireless LAN profiles. So it is kind of the big picture of um, all of the, um, the network components that we have, um, all of the profiles that we have for the entire enterprise. And then that mobility master, depending on how we've configured our hierarchy, pushes that configuration to different mobility controllers. So you can see here in the, um, in the diagram, we've got different MCs. So those are mobility controller one, two, and three. And our user traffic is tunneled to those different mobility controllers. So the idea of clustering is that we select the best access point for the, for the user based on the RF environment, and then those access points will be tunneling traffic back to the mobility controllers. Um, this architecture allows us to provide very high availability for all of the clients. And if we have any failover events, we have a, a controller failure, an AP failure, um, we're able to maintain service for all of the users. So jumping into a little bit more of how we actually um, provide this clustering or why we do this, it's the idea of to have roaming across an entire campus. So in a lot of Aruba um, enterprise environments, we're seeing very, very large campus environments. Um, those may be across different buildings. It may be multiple floors in a building. You know, we're talking tens of thousands of users um, across that campus. And so the, we maintain a centralized database, a centralized hierarchy in the mobility master, but then we decentralize the user traffic through all of the different mobility controllers. So the idea is that we can have um, clients that can fail with no interruptions. So you can have a voice call in session and we can maintain a, um, a stateful uh, failover from one mobility controller to another. Um, another feature that we have is the load balancing. So again, being able to use our RF optimization of client match and air match to basically select the best um, RF environment, the best access point for that uh, particular client. And then load balance. Um, as I'm sure most of you are familiar, you know, our, our big weakness in our RF environment is our clients. So we have very little control about uh, over the client behavior and what clients are actually doing um, and which access points they're selecting, which, you know, channels they're on and, and all of that. So by controlling the network environment, the network architecture, um, we can kind of force clients to connect to one access point or a different access point. Um, you know, we've got some um, technology called band steering where we try to steer clients onto the five gigahertz channels versus the 2.4, getting them off the very congested 2.4 um, frequency band. So there's some technology that goes into that load balancing, uh, but it's also the concept that if a, we have a failure, we also have a backup, we have redundancy there as well. Um, and then the APs are load balanced. So we have our user traffic flowing through our access points and then to our controllers, our mobility controllers, and we now load balance those, the AP load across those um, MCs as well. 
So this is just a little bit of detail. I mean, for, for those of you who are a little more familiar with Aruba technology, I wanted to throw this in there about you know, what our capacity is. So in our AOS 8, um, depending on the controller models in the 7200 series, we can have up to 12 um, controllers in a cluster. And in the 7000 series, we can have up to four nodes in a, in a cluster, so four controllers. So just to give you an idea of the different um, um, infrastructure that we can have per um, the cluster capacity. We also now have virtual mobility controllers, so we can have up to four VMCs, uh, virtual controllers within a cluster there. Um, so just some of the terminology we use within the cluster, um, we have different concepts called roles. So these are um, anchor controller roles, depending on whether it's for the AP or for the user. So this is what provides us our redundancy, is that every um, access point has an anchor controller and every user has an anchor controller. And then of course, to provide that backup, we have standby anchor controllers for both the users and the access points. Um, and essentially what's happening here in, and I'll, and I'll show you here in this slide, is that there's active tunnels that are being um, uh, built between the access points and um, the controllers. And that's where the user traffic is flowing. And then there's gonna be backup um, tunnels that are going to be going to the standby um, anchor controllers. So by having these tunnels all up um, and running, it's very, we can do a very fast, seamless um, failover from one controller to another. So as we move through this, you can see we have active tunnels and the standby tunnels, um, ones to the, basically essentially the primary, which is called the um, active anchor controller, and then the standby, which is our, is our backup anchor controller. And so when we have a um, some sort of a, a failure that's detected by um, the controller heartbeat um, failing, then the standby anchor controller will have the AP failover directly to it. The user traffic will flow to the new um, controller and all the, um, the, the session state will uh, be maintained. At this point, once we are now on that standby anchor controller, we have to then create another, um, I'm sorry, uh, you know, the standby moves to an active mode we then have to have another standby. So the, the um, redundancy is being constantly built. So if we have multiple failures within our network, um, we're able to maintain the state by always having a backup um, controller for that access point to, to send its traffic. So again, there'll be a new standby um, assigned by the cluster leader. So the cluster leader is just a designated controller that's, that's basically monitoring all of this. So we have the same concept for the users as well. So in that previous couple of slide series, we were showing you um, what the backup is for the access points, but we also have um, anchor controllers for the users. So the user traffic is gonna be flowing to one of these um, uh, anchor controllers and it's, it's called the active user anchor controller. And then if say that client were to roam, or if there was a failure, and this is what supports both mobility and redundancy, then the client would uh, move to a new um, anchor controller. So it would always have a primary and a backup. So as that client is roaming, as we have roaming events occurring across the enterprise, um, you know, the client reconnects to a new access point and it, it will initially be um, set to the same anchor controller. And if there is a network failure, it will go to a standby. So in terms of how we determine which user goes to which controller, there's a hashing function. So the user is mapped via um, a hash on its um, uh, MAC address. So there's a, a process to that to essentially try to get a even uh, mapping of users to different controllers. We're trying to load balance this across our network infrastructure. So as each user connects, that hashing algorithm occurs in the access point, and then it gets that user is getting mapped to different controllers. And then the cluster leader is maintaining all of this. So within the cluster, there is one um, cluster leader that's maintaining the whole process. And again, the cluster leader is also selecting a backup, a standby user anchor controller on a client by client basis. So the idea is here that it, every user and every access point is going to have both a primary controller and a backup or a standby um, and it, essentially that's how we're providing the redundancy and of course there's heartbeats going uh, between those to maintain connectivity 
So let's talk a little bit more about how the traffic flows. So the traffic flows within a GRE tunnel. So GRE itself is not inherently secure. There's no encryption within GRE. We are relying on the 802.11 traffic being encrypted by some other technology. So most likely WPA2 um, encryption. So the, the um, traffic is flowing to these different anchor controllers and standby anchor controllers, but in a, uh, in a GRE tunnel. Um, so there's actually several GRE tunnels built, and you can see here it's per, uh, per radio and per SSID. There's also GRE tunnels for Keep Alives. Um, Aruba has their own internal um, management protocol called PAPI, and it uses UDP port 80 to 11. So we see all of these tunnels being built. Um, you can see there in the legend, the different color code. So between an access point that's advertising a particular SSID and both the, the primary um, anchor controller and the standby anchor controller for that AP. So we have those tunnels are being maintained all um, continuously. So we can very quickly have um, a redirection in the case of a failover event. Also, client state is being maintained across those um, controllers. So all the controllers are familiar with the current sessions, the firewall sessions, the role in the, of that um, user, and uh, maintaining all of that information across the, the enterprise. So as we see here, we have um, uh, certain uh, PAPI traffic that is our uh, management traffic going between our different um, uh, user and standby uh, user anchor controllers. So we've got controllers, that, they can be all different controllers as you see here in this diagram for both the APs and for the user itself. So moving on, I know I keep mentioning this, this stateful failover, moving on a little bit to this failover, there's some things that, um, that have to be configured, that we have to ensure um, are enabled um, in terms of our configuration. And this is just a real quick snapshot of the config. Obviously, we don't have the time to really get into a lot of the details here um, in this short webinar, but this is the kind of thing that we address um, more in our training courses. So you would see a lot more detail of the configuration. But essentially, you have to have redundancy mode turned on. So you can see here a little bit of the CLI config um, for this um, uh, cluster configuration. Um, so redundancy mode has to be on. And the cluster members have to share a VLAN. So they have to be L2 connected. So we see this most primarily in a, let's say, like a single building uh, campus environment where you have all of these controllers um, that share a VLAN across those um, devices. Now, we can also do mobility across a layer three uh, boundary, but that is implemented with mobile IP as is pretty much the industry standard for roaming across layer three boundaries. So ma to maintain the stateful failover um, and maintain the sessions, the cluster members, meaning the different controllers, have to share a VLAN. So essentially what happens is the client state is synced to the standby user anchor controller. These are some of the variables that are synced. Um, and again, we can provide more detail about this in our training courses, but essentially information about the device, which is the station, um, the user itself. So uh, what user is, is connected, say if it's a radius uh, user, um, if it's L2 or L3 authenticated, um, some of the uh, keying and the cache, the PMK caching, all of that is synced so that when there's a failover event or a roaming event, the client state would be on that standby uh, controller, you know, ready to go there. So all the high value sessions. So we're talking about um, through deep packet inspection, being able to, to monitor what sessions that uh, user and that device have. So if they've got uh, voice sessions or video sessions or anything that's considered a high value session, um, that would be synced to the the standby, up to 10 sessions per user. So the client will not get de-authenticated when they fail over. So um, if there was a, um, a network event that caused a, a failure, um, the client would maintain these session states on the, the standby anchor controller. So it would be a fairly seamless, um, at least for these high value sessions, it'd be a seamless um, failover for the, for the end user. So you can see this in some of our detail in our controller configuration, um, looking at the standby, um, the user table on the standby. So the standby controller already has that user information 
Um, so if there were a failure event um, or a roaming event, we already have that information right there on the standby controller. It already knows the IP address of the client, MAC address, the, the role that it's in, VLAN, um, all of the other information there as well. So clustering also gives us, in addition to redundancy and load balancing, it also gives us this mobility concept. So this is again what Aruba is really known for is um, you know, the, the whole mobility and being able to move, having clients and users move throughout the network in a seamless fashion. So the way this is um, the way this operates is the user connects to an AP. We talked about the AP um, hashing the user's MAC address and basically assigning a user anchor controller. So now we know where to send that AP knows where to send that user traffic. Um, so that is being sent in a, um, a GRE tunnel. Again, we're relying on the 802.11 traffic to be encrypted. So it's being put inside of a GRE tunnel. It's per radio and per SSID. And then that is flowing from that AP into um, the, the primary or the, the user anchor controller at this point. When the user roams, so the user is moving throughout the environment, the client initiates a roam to another access point, um, so in this case AP2, then that access point, the, the access point has that same GRE tunnel set up to that client's user anchor controller. So as far as the user is concerned, the traffic flow doesn't change. So the active tunnel now goes from AP1 over to AP2, and the traffic is still flowing through the same controller. Things like firewall policies and QoS and uh, VLANs, those would all be applied there through that controller. So that, that all of that information would remain the same as the user roams from one AP to another. So essentially clients are staying anchored to a single mobility controller when they're roaming across controllers. So another um, big feature that we have within AOS 8 is this concept of um, being able to upgrade the cluster. So we can upgrade the cluster while the network is up and running. Um, I'm sure several of you have attended some of our Atmosphere conferences. We've done live upgrades with thousands and thousands of users um, who are currently connected and maintaining um, uh, you know, network connectivity and um, not really seeing any uh, degradation in performance of the network while the network is being upgraded. So we can upgrade individual modules. So things like the app RF component, uh, which gives us a visibility into the RF environment, things like air match, um, our air group components. So each of these are different modules and we can upgrade these specific applications without even having to upgrade the entire controller firmware. We can also do an entire firmware upgrade, which is um, called an in-service upgrade while the network is up and running. And so I'll show you a little bit more about that. So basically, our as our controllers are being upgraded to a new um, Aruba operating system, the APs will also be upgraded. And um, the upgrade will be planned in sequence so as not to provide any disruption to the users who are currently connected. And this is all happening auto, in an automated fashion. So there's no IT user intervention. You know, network administrators don't have to, um, you know, they can just monitor this event rather than uh, being active in, um, deter, you know, doing the actual upgrades controller by controller. So there's, again, very zero, down, zero downtime in this process and very minimal um, RF impact if, uh, there's a big if, if the network is designed properly. And so we'll look at that a little bit here. Um, in this next couple slides. So we can only do an in-service upgrade when we have RF redundancy, which means we have overlapping coverage areas. Because obviously as one AP has to be upgraded and co goes down, we have to have another access point serving that physical space. So we'll show you a, a diagram of this in the next couple slides, but we have to have overlapping RF coverage areas, um, meaning more than one access point serving each physical space. Um, and obviously the cluster itself has to have redundancy enabled so that the process we just talked about of as controllers are, are going down and rebooting because they're taking on the new operating system, the new firmware, then other controllers can maintain those, um, those user states. And again, the cluster, um, all the controllers should be L2 connected so that they share a VLAN so we may, can maintain all of this across the, the layer two network. So in terms of um, overlapping RF coverage, on the left-hand side here, we see um, kind, of a, kind of a standard network environment. Uh, we see um, 
uh, you know, our, our RF cells around our access points. This is, uh, you know, showing five gigahertz was channel 36. We see a client um, connected there, or at least in the um, in the service area, the coverage area for the access point in the lower left-hand corner. So with that current environment, there is enough overlap there that individual access points can go down. The neighboring access points through um, all of our RF optimization, like client match and air match, can increase the RF coverage area. So we'll see during this maintenance window, so while the upgrades are occurring, we may have fewer access points serving the clients, as you can see over on the right-hand side during this maintenance window. And these access points will um, increase the power so that they will have a larger coverage area, but still maintaining enough coverage for all of um, the current clients. If you were to try to do a um, in-place upgrade, in-service upgrade with the um, diagram on the right-hand side where you just have a coverage model and these access points were already at the highest power, there would obviously be no way to take certain access points down because there wouldn't be another access point that could cover that, um, that RF space. So it's why it's really important that you have a proper um, RF design prior to doing this. So that's the one caveat is obviously the network would have to be properly designed with enough RF coverage to do um, to do the upgrades. So this is a quick overview of how it works and in our training courses we have a whole lot of course more configuration and, and slides and kind of step-by-step -step labs on how you actually configure all of this. Uh, but essentially the cluster manager and air match are communicating. So the air match um, functionality within the, um, the mobility master is to set the channel and the power for all the access points in the enterprise. Um, and they do, it does that by gathering information about the RF environment. Um, through a, there's a, a, some scanning functionality we have within the access points and also within um, air monitors, which are essentially just RF scanners um, that are access points that are just in a scanning mode. So, the cluster manager starts to partition the APs. So looking at the RF coverage based on the five gigahertz channels, because that's our primary concern in most enterprise environments. And then it targets specific controllers um, for each uh, access uh, AP partition area. And then the cluster update manager will have the mobility controllers copy this image, the new firmware image in sequentially, and then perform the upgrade in a sequential fashion where APs can fail over to their standby um, anchor controllers. <clears throat> There's also a way of increasing the speed of this, called something called AP image preload, which basically means that we load the firmware image on the access point um, and then reboot them so that there's not multiple reboots in the process. If anyone has um, spent time in maybe the older AOS 6X uh, code stream, there was could be several reboots during an upgrade, but we've tried to streamline this with the AP image preload so that there's a faster um, uh, loading of the image, uh, of the new firmware image on the access points. And then the cluster update manager, we start the mobility controllers one by one, um, kind of in a sequential fashion to ensure that there's always um, other controllers available to both the access points and the users. And then at the end of all of this, there's a reload balancing of the client load and, um, and air match will again uh, adjust the RF channel and power if necessary. So that's kind of the big picture of how this, um, uh, this uh, in-service upgrade um, occurs. So talking more about kind of what's on the horizon um, in the in the future for our unified wired and wireless policy, um, this is a big push within Aruba probably over the last two years or so, um, especially as we have all of the new switching portfolio um, coming online. We're seeing very um, high level uh, core and aggregation layer switches um, to support really large infrastructure environments. And so with AOS 8 and some of the new features, we are pushing out the same concept of access control that we've done in our wireless network for a long time. We're now pushing out to the wired network. So some of the ways that we can um, implement this network automation is this concept of roles. So Aruba has had roles for a long time. Um, I started, I've been working at Aruba for over eight years. And I started working with the, um, the AOS, uh, the first version of AOS I worked with was 2.4. We're now on 
eight sat four. <laughs> so it's been a it's been a long road, but we even had roles back at that point. Um, so roles have been a concept since the inception of the Aruba operating system. And the idea is that um, the role will follow the user and the device no matter how or where they connect. So whether it's wireless or wired, um, that user will always maintain their role in the network. And of course the roles are tied into authentication and we can apply a lot of things through roles such as the whole access policy. So VLANs, firewall policies, QoS, bandwidth contracts, um, all of these things are wrapped into the concept of a role. And users can move through um, different roles. So we have pre-authentication roles, so they'll get a certain role that limits their access to the network um, and say to the internet, maybe you have guest users, we might limit their access until they've gone through a captive portal and authenticated, um, and then they would get a post-authentication role. So these roles can change um, as the user is moving through the network, but the user is only ever in one role at a time. Um, and they just move from role to role based upon authentication and access policy. You can even have different roles. You may wanna have a different role for the same user, whether they connect wired or wireless. So you can, again, all of that stuff, um, it's, it's very flexible in the um, Aruba architecture to configure that. So something that's um, come out in AOS 8 is this concept of tunneled node. So we can essentially segment our, um, our, our wired traffic and have um, stateful firewall enforcement and visibility into that traffic on the wired side, just like we've done on the wireless side for a lot of years. So it doesn't really matter, you know, in the past, um, users are really tied to their IP subnet or their VLAN that they're in. So the access would be given by subnet or VLAN, whereas now with the concept of tunneled node, we're tunneling all of that to the controller and then letting the controller apply the access policy based upon that role. We also have a concept of, again, to try to automate um, and, and ease the burden um, on the, uh, the network administrator, we also have this concept of downloadable user roles. So coming from our ClearPass server, we can have roles that are created in the ClearPass server and that are downloaded to the controllers as necessary. Um, and that increases our security. Um, and it, again, it's a single source of creation of the policy. So we don't have administrators having to configure things in multiple places. So basically the concept of tunneled node is, is what we've done for a long time on our wireless network with our tunneling um, so that all of the traffic is reaching the controller and then the controller is, is applying a, a consistent network security policy. So this can be done via port on a wired uh, Aruba OS switch or it can be done per user. And the concept of user is be role-based policy enforcement. So the concept of, of this tunneled node can be either a, uh, a, a user-based tunnel node or a port-based tunneling. And this gives us ability to run the traffic through the Aruba controller and take advantage of all the security features and all of the, um, the, the access policy features within the Aruba controller. And again, we can include ClearPass in this, in this whole um, process to provide the authentication. So ClearPass, the traffic can go through ClearPass um, to provide authentication uh, functionality. And then, as I've already mentioned, we separate traffic into different GRE tunnels to just provide a little bit more enhanced security there, um, and then providing the redundancy through redundant controllers and, and clustering support. So what the unified policy looks like for wired and wireless clients is we've got the enforcement through ClearPass. So the authentication um, is uh, the authentication process is that the controllers are interacting with ClearPass to provide us a, a central radio server um, to provide um, enforcement of our um, authentication. And then Airwave is providing us the visibility. So Airwave will tell us all about the users who are connected, all the clients. Um, we do DHCP fingerprinting, so we know what operating system the clients are running. We have user information. We have statistics, um, whether it's going through a wired port or wireless connectivity. Airwave provides us that visibility into the client. Um, Airwave is is a centralized server, a good repository for long-term monitoring. So we can see if there's um, if there's RF issues with that client, is that client uh, performing a lot of roams from access point to access point? Um, you know, have, has the client had authentication issues? So Airwave is our central network management interface and providing us the visibility into what's happening with the clients. 
And then within the controller, we have the capabilities of the firewall um, app RF, which is giving us um, the, the base of the deep packet inspection and visibility into not only the protocols that the clients are connecting with, but also the URLs. So maybe a, a client is out surfing the web and we can see what uh, URLs the, the client is actually going to. Um, and so all of this provides us that visibility um, into what's happening um, on, on the, user, the user experience. So a little bit more detail about the, the two kinds of tunneling, uh, the per, per port and per user. So to, to just get a little bit more into this um, in a per port mode, um, essentially the controller is interacting with uh, the Aruba OS switches. Um, kind of a side note to all this, if some of you are, um, haven't worked with Aruba in the last, uh, I'd say about two years, we now have an entire portfolio of Aruba OS switching. So all from the access layer up to the core, uh, we've got a lot of new um, uh, switching features and we've actually got a new operating system that runs on some of our core switches called Aruba OS CX. Um, and actually we are in the process of developing training courses on, on all of that technology right now. Um, so if you're interested in, in these um, kind of core level um, switching concepts, um, that would be, that would be a, a place to get more information is through one of those training courses. Um, but essentially, the, we have, like I said, per user, which is role-based, or per port, which is um, for the physical port on the switches. And so the controller and the switch um, uh, negotiate the capabilities of that switch, and it's depending on the AOS uh, versioning. Um, to say, okay, we're going to be only doing per port mode here as opposed to user mode, which may or may not be supported. Um, and then we can tunnel that traffic from the port of that switch to the controller, and then the controller can apply a centralized uh, policy, just as we would have done in a wireless environment, but now it's on a, a physical um, switch. And then the per user mode, we've got... Um, uh, heartbeats that are going back and forth between our, our switches and our controllers. And they're, again, negotiating um, what the process is. They're negotiating the capabilities. Oh, is this a, a, an AOS 6 um, device or is this an AOS 8 uh, device? So uh, we are supporting two code streams right now, the 6X and the 8X. All of the things I've just been showing you with clustering, uh, all of those um, failover features, those are all um, components of the AOS 8. Um, and we're seeing a, a, a strong move with a lot of our uh, customers moving to AOS 8, and we're doing the same thing within our training and certification programs is we've had training courses out on AOS 8 for about almost a year now, probably about 10 months, um, and we're seeing a lot of our certification exams move to AOS 8. So that is kind of the future of all of these uh, technologies. And so there has to be happy um, negotiations between the switch and the controller to determine what the capabilities are, whether that switch supports per user or per port, and obviously whether the MC, the controller, is a 6X or an 8X um, uh, operating system. And then if there's a, a cluster, there's other information that's sent about the clustering uh, process because even in AOS 8 we can run a controller in standalone mode it could just be a, a standalone controller a single controller obviously you don't then have any other clustering or redundancy features that we've been talking about so when the user connects the authentication is sent to radius so to ClearPass um, and then that ClearPass server is going to reply based upon how the user is authenticated and provide role information um, and then the controller is applying that user role to that user so uh, a, a GRE tunnel is built for that, um, for that user traffic and the traffic will flow from through that switch to the controller and all these um, firewall policies, um, VLANs, you know, whatever has been configured in the, um, in the controller would be applied to that user. So let's say that the, the user role was um, uh, just to allow only local traffic, then we could apply only lo local, you know, traffic would be allowed. Maybe this, this user can't go out to the internet. Maybe they haven't authenticated yet. Um, all of those things are configurable in the controller. But the concept is, is that's a per user authentication process as opposed to a per port, which has kind of always been the traditional way of applying access uh, policies in a wired infrastructure. 
And again, as that user moves, maybe they, they uh, have another user that plugs into a different port. So you can see here um, a different user, they may authenticate through the same process, um, but they get a different uh, VLAN and a different role. So in this case, it's finance versus IT. They would have different access policies um, and, and you know, different firewall uh, roles in terms of what they were allowed to do on the network. So the next generation of, of this Aruba uh, process is dynamic segmentation. So it's kind of taking what I just showed you to the next level um, and applying something called colorless ports. So essentially it doesn't matter um, what physical port a user plugs into, they're gonna get the same access policy no matter which port they plug into. Um, so consistent across the entire infrastructure. Um, and then some of the automation that is coming out of this is the ability to have, as I mentioned before, downloadable user roles coming from the Radius server. So what that means is we don't have to configure all the user roles in our controllers. We just create those in one place inside the Radius server, inside ClearPass, and then have those be downloaded um, and applied locally on the controllers. Okay, so that's kind of all of the, um, the core functionality that we have in our AOS 8. Um, now we're gonna jump into some of the new, I, what I think is the new cool stuff that's just been announced in the last couple of weeks. So we recently had the Atmosphere um, Conference in Bangkok um, and some, some of these things were announced and uh, some of you may have seen or watched the uh, Mobility Field Day last week. And so some of these things were also presented in there. So some of the new things Aruba has coming out, um, some of the um, the new access point uh, for outdoor capabilities is an AP387, um, and this is supporting 11AD. Um, so real quick, um, you know, I'm sure y'all maybe are familiar with this or have seen some stuff on 11AD, but just get to get some more, you know, more info, a quick snapshot of what is 11AD. So 11AD is a new um, IEEE standard. It's sometimes referred to as wide gig. You may have heard that kind of you know, jargon in the industry, but essentially it's using the 60 gigahertz spectrum. So a few things about 60 gigahertz, if you don't know, doesn't penetrate walls, easily blocked by, um, by obstructions. So really the best use of it is an outdoor clear line of sight um, environment. So traditionally these links have, have been pretty expensive um, and require very precise antenna um, installation procedures and um, alignment uh, to ensure um, good connectivity uh, on an AD link. Also, um, any longer um, length uh, links have a huge um, rain fade. So rain would cause a lot of fading of the RF signal. So those are just some kind of big picture of what um, 11 AD is. And then to get into the new access point that Aruba has, the 387, it is similar to our other outdoor hardened um, hardware in terms of being, um, you know, weatherproof and, and all of that um, weatherproof environment and reusing some of our mounting um, solutions that we have for our other um, AP270 series. But the difference with the, the 387 is that we've got some um, technology in there to make the link self-acquiring. So it uh, bypasses this need for very uh, precise aiming uh, of the point-to-point -point link between the two access points. And essentially the way we do that is that we have a scanning uh, technology. So being able to scan um, 40 degrees um, horizontally, plus or minus 40 degrees, and uh, plus or minus 10 degrees vertically. So being able to sweep um, and looking for the other um, end of this point-to-point -point link. And so the 387 has this capability of very quickly and easily being um, set up, configured and set up um, by someone who maybe isn't, um, you know, a, a super antenna geek, right? Someone who doesn't have experience with, um, with this very uh, precise aiming of point to point links. The other um, feature of the 387 is that we're adding in not only the 60 gigahertz radio, but having a fail back to a five gigahertz radio. So, um, this is one of the things we'll be demoing in the deep dive sessions at uh, Wi-Fi Trek. So if you want to see how this works, um, come take a look at that. And, um, and, and you can see uh, what happens when the, five, the 60 gigahertz link maybe has a, um, a degradation because of a rain incident or a, a blocking of the point to point link, then we can fail over to the five gigahertz, which is not uh, as impacted by the weather. 
So just a real quick um, you know, diagram, this is the, the 387, um, some features of it. It's got a um, basically a little umbrella here to uh, protect, protect the 60 gigahertz radio from, from rain and water sheeting on the front of that antenna infrastructure, um, powered by a PoE port. Um, other than that, pretty um, standard. Again, the mount is reusable from our um, AP270 uh, series. Okay, and I want to jump into 11AX just in terms of the time I have here. I only have a few more minutes left in the webinar. Um, I know probably everybody who's on this webinar has heard of 11AX, has seen different presentations. Um, you know, I've been uh, participated in, in many of them that are out there. I've seen Dave Coleman's presentation. I've seen Devin Aiken's presentation. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff about 11AX. So I don't want to rehash all of that again. I just want to show you what Aruba has coming out in um, the future for, the, for 11AX capabilities. So if you don't know what it is, um, if you uh, haven't been keeping up with the new technology, essentially 11AX is, is a new um, standard for Wi-Fi, um, providing an increase in performance um, and focusing on efficiency. So focusing on high density environments and um, optimizing efficiency in our networks. Um, a couple just, you know, um, maybe sound bites here. We, uh, 11AX is, um, is, is very dependent on the client support, of course, and there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the, of course, we're only going to be as good as our clients, and we all know that. So um, there is the ability to upgrade the infrastructure, but then also the clients would have to support that same technology. Um, but a few, you know, sound bites to this is that it supports both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, where 11 AC was only in, in a 5 gigahertz band. Also some improved power efficiency for client devices, so power saving mechanisms there. Um, and just a more efficient and optimized network for both indoor and outdoor um, environments. So a couple of things about why we should care. Again, we know that the client performance is key. We know that the client support has to be there in order to get any of the new features of 11AX. But again, if you if you have are looking to do a network upgrade or install a new network, it would make a lot of sense to make that um, step up to 11AX so that the infrastructure is there um, when the clients are, are you know, available and um, are actually implemented in our new client devices. So when is all this going to happen? Well, you know, it's we're all kind of dependent on the IEEE timeline. Um, so we're looking um, for the Wave 1 certification of 11AX um, and the Wi-Fi Alliance to be completed looks like the the end of um, 2019 so we're looking somewhere between August and and December of 2019 again you know these uh, these timelines always change I've been through so many um, new 80211 versions um, when I started with with Wi-Fi it was 80211 that's it there was no a B there was no amendment it was just the uh, original 80211 standard at one and two megabit so you know we've seen so many um, evolutions of new amendments to the 802.11 standard. So we all know we've got to take these timelines a little bit, um, you know, we, we've got to be a little bit careful with some of these timelines. But we're starting to see chipsets, some of the drivers are starting to come out not quite mature yet. Uh, we'll see client devices coming out sometime next year. Some vendors are already shipping access points or very soon to be shipping access points. We also need to pay attention to our switching infrastructure and looking at the 802 that 3BT, which is our new um, higher PoE output, we're going to need to support um, the, the improved um, uh, optimization of the new chipsets in the 11AX access points. So just a quick snapshot of what Aruba sees kind of for the roadmap. So of course, as many other vendors, you know, starting late 2018, we're going to be um, introducing some of these new 11AX access points. We'll be focusing on campus models because that's um, our bread and butter. That's where we see most deployments is in an enterprise campus environment. Um, and, you know, again, we're seeing this as a infrastructure upgrade and then we'll get the new capabilities when the clients um, are, are available. So again, just an interest of time, kind of hurrying through the last few slides here, but um, essentially um, Aruba's 11AX, we've got new access point line coming out. It's the, all the 500 series. So a 515, an AP 535, and an AP 555. So keeping with our, um, our, our numbering of our models, 
uh, moving up in the performance and capabilities. You can see the, the different PoE support that's going to be necessary, the 802.3 BT for the 555 um, access point, and the number of uh, spatial streams and radio chains that are supported. So if anyone has any questions, um, I think we'll, Tom and I will be taking a few questions here at the end. Also, you know, the whole concept here is to show you what little sneak peek into what we're going to be doing at Wi-Fi Trek in the Aruba Deep Dive sessions. We'll be doing those on Wednesday and Thursday and evening um, after the main session has ended, showing you some demos. We're going to bring, bring some equipment in, showing you some of these, uh, these new access points and, and capabilities. Um, my focus is obviously on Aruba training and certification. So if you want more information about our training courses, um, we offer a wide variety of um, delivery mechanisms. So instructor-led, virtual instructor-led, um, e-learning. Uh, we have HPE Press self-study guides. So every one of our um, courses, um, after we create the new, we develop the new training course and it's gone through a beta process, um, a couple months later, we'll see an HPE Press self-study book. So for people who are interested in our certifications and want to just read up on it themselves, that's a, a quick and easy way is to look at the self-study guides. And then of course, uh, we have the Airheads community. So community.arubanetworks.com, where you can um, see our different events. We have um, our larger atmosphere conferences. We also have more localized, they're called um, ATM meetups. Um, so you can learn about those events. We have the validated reference design guides there. You know, there's forums for you to read, ask questions of other um, Aruba experts. And then a little bit about what we do at Aruba Education Services. So our, our main charter education services is to enable Aruba advocates. What we want is our customers, partners, employees, we want to, to train them and teach them about Aruba technologies and solutions so that they can go out and, and to promote those products and to deploy the solutions that we've presented um, and, and to teach other people about um, our technology. So that's, that's essentially what we do is to um, promote the technology uh, both internally and externally. And we do that through training courses and certification. So we have an entire certification uh, program. I didn't want to focus too much on this. I know in past um, events, I've done different uh, views in our certification curriculum. If you have questions, certainly email me, reach out to me. Um, there's a lot of information on the website um, that has all of our um, course schedules and you know training uh, delivery options um, that you can get more information. If you just need to have a general question about training, it's arubatraining at hpe.com. And then this is, I just included this, I won't go through all the details, but this is just the big picture of our certification structure. Um, and essentially all of our certifications follow an associate professional expert level um, progression through the certification track. We offer that for both mobility and switching. We have a new design track. Um, we have a clear pass track. We have a location services, um, training course and exam. So um, a lot of different components. In the future, there's a few things on our roadmap. I know maybe a few people have heard some sneak peeks. Um, we'll be doing some new things surrounding security with our new introspect product. We will be doing some things surrounding network management um, and, and cloud management um, as we expand the Airwave um, product offering. So you'll be seeing some new certification um, and courses coming out from Aruba Education Services. And then lastly, I just wanted to promote the, um, the atmosphere conferences. Those are a great way to get, um, you know, to meet all the experts, to get, uh, you know, an overload of technical information. So um, we offer the larger atmosphere conferences, and then we offer local meetups. So local meetups are shorter, one day, um, quick overview of a new Aruba products. We'll do some demos there. So if you want to get more information about that, go to the Airheads community um, to learn more about those, those meetups. And um, that concludes what I have. So I think I'm pretty much right on time. Um, so I'll kind of turn it back over here to Tom. Excellent. Thanks, Kimberly. Great information. Hey, I have a quick question. Can you go back two slides to your certification structures? Um, sure. So right here, this is a question I have. Um, is there any prerequisite for the ACDP? Uh, or can someone actually start right there if they've got a lot they of can experience. start right there okay yeah, yeah, that's can, what i thought 
Yeah, so we, we kind of went a little bit backwards on the design, honestly. And I will tell you, for eight years I've been in Aruba, all I've ever wanted is a full design track. And it always has been pushed out for some new product. Okay, we got this new hot product, we got to talk about this. And um, we've really expanded um, in the last probably year our curriculum development team. We have now nine people that are working on course curriculum and certifications um, in addition to myself, so it's 10 of us. Um, so we, we now have the we, we now have the manpower to do all the things that we want to do for a long time. And one of them is to create a full design track. So we have had the design expert for a long time, but we now have a training course for the design expert exam. And now we have a course and an exam at the professional level. Okay. Um, Right now, we don't have an associate level for design. That may come in the future um, as we kind of fill out these tracks a little bit more. Um, but our focus lately in the last few months and will be for the next few is new products. The Introspect product, the Net Insight product, OSCX, um, um, Cape Networks. We've just got so many new products that Aruba is, um, is coming out with that we have to focus our efforts on developing those training courses. So we might see an ACDA in the future, but right now you can you just jump right to ACDA. Okay, cool. Um, and I have three books on my shelf um, in the Aruba certification tracks, the Mobility Associate, the Mobility Professional, and the Design Professional, the hardcover books from HP Press. Uh, am I missing any that have been released? Um, switching. Are you, did, if you're interested in any of the switching, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's switching uh, HP press switching books as well. Okay, so nothing yet on ClearPass or anything like that. No, we don't have any right now on ClearPass, but we're okay. so the reason is ClearPass is undergoing a a versioning upgrade, and that again has been a long uh, awaited. Now that we've got some more manpower, we're doing some upgrades to all of our courses and our exams for ClearPass. Um, so we'll, when we do that upgrade, then we'll probably see HP press books, um, coming out for that. You know, the, the press books is, as probably most people are aware, have a, they have to have a longer shelf life. Um, our training courses, we can update mm, every six or eight months, depending on needs, but the, the HP press, we need to really, in order to publish those, you know, have to, they have to be able to sit for a year or two. Um, and so we don't want to publish that on an older, uh, version of ClearPass. Okay, gotcha. But that means that there's other options like e-learning. You know, if someone doesn't want to attend a full training class, we have we've created these new, probably in the last year or two, new e-learning options and self-directed labs. So essentially, you get access to a remote lab and you can go through all the lab steps on your own, um, all the configuration. So that's another option for someone who doesn't want to sit a full-blown class. 